Uh, some changes are taking place here at Believer's Chapel, some good changes, uh, some changes that we just feel like we need to make, which affects, affects some, does not affect all. Um, we have made a decision to cancel our Saturday night services. We no longer had, last night was the last service on Saturday. Uh, we're going into our picnic next week. July 4th is a Saturday. We weren't going to have church on July 4th. Um, and in that, we just we made a decision uh, because we were looking at canceling Saturday night service anyways, even just for the summer. Um, because, listen, we understand we have a short season of sun. That, that's just the truth. If you lived here long, you understand that we do have a short season of sun. And uh, we want families to enjoy one another. We are a family church, and we want people to enjoy family and different things. Saturday nights, uh, we have done Saturday nights since the first Saturday in October of 2012. Uh, just so you know, a Saturday night service takes about five hours for the team and volunteers. About five hours, folks. We get here between three and four o'clock, and we're here till sometimes nine o'clock. And when you understand it, it's a, it's a minimum of a five-hour deal every Saturday. And that has been going on since October of 2012. And the team has been just, they, they and me personally, honestly, I love our Saturday night services. There is such an atmosphere here on a Saturday night. The, the day is done, it's over, you just come just with nothing else on your mind, nothing ahead of us, but just to come before him in worship and word. Saturday nights, even last night's service was blowout, folks. It was so powerful, so powerful presence in this place. But we had to make a decision that we're going to cancel Saturday night services. Now for the summer, we are having Sunday services 9 and 11. For the summer, we're having Sunday services 9 and 11, as we always do, starting the first week in September. Get this, this is huge. First week in September, we're going to three services on Sunday. We have to have three services. We have to. Come September, you have to have three services. And God has blessed us, and we're in such a place that we have to have three services. So come September, you'll hear about this more and more, but this is just fresh off the press, man. It's just taking place, and we want to bring it to you. As soon as we, as soon as we know the decisions were made, we want to bring it to you. So, so you guys can adjust. But for the summer, 9 and 11, Sunday morning, no Saturday night services. Come Sunday mornings in September, we go to three services, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Not too early. Not too late, just the way we like it. Not too hot, not too cold. Not too early, not too late, man. It's just, this is, we are very excited. Brennan, and look at you guys are like already calculating like, man, that's like, there's not a lot of time. Listen, Brennan and I, we are working on our service time. We will, we will get a powerhouse packed, life-changing service in an hour and 15 minutes. And you're thinking, no way. Oh, it will be done. <laughs> It will be done. We will renegotiate and we will figure out a time slot. Every minute counts, gang. I'm telling you, it'll be an hour and 15 minutes of absolute complete power. And we will get it done because we, we are going to look at the clock and say every minute, man, every minute counts when you're talking about an hour and 15 minutes. So come September, we are in three services on Sunday, 830, 10 o'clock and 1130, which is just, we are very, very excited about this. At that point, we are going to own the property over here, which gives us two driveways. We are going to have an in to the parking lot, and we're going to have just an exit out of the parking lot, which really clears up any type of congestion. That's going to be huge. We're taking that property in August. So come September, man, all systems go, all systems flow. If we had to, we have the whole field to even add more parking lot. Gang, we are in a great, I'm telling you, please hear this, we are in a great place as Believer's Chapel, a great place to see what God can do. I can't wait to see three completely packed services on a Sunday, but we are so, we can't wait for that new sanctuary to show up, man. We can't wait to see what God can do through provision for a new sanctuary so we don't have to be all crazy. But we are, we like, we kind of like crazy, just so you know. So, um, you know, just again, Saturday night services are, are, are going to be no longer and um, start, but for the summer, we are 9 and 11 on Sunday, starting September. We're going to, when, when, you know, vacations are over and people are really back, back on track, we, we go to three services, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30, which really, I, I, for those who serve and volunteer on, sun, on Saturday nights, they have to come back on Sunday to get the message and get the word. Now, as you serve at 8.30, you're at the 10 o'clock service, you're out by, what, 11.15. Gang, that's not, that's, Pretty cool right there, man. We're so, so pumped, so pumped about this. And uh, man, we're looking forward to it. So that's kind of what's happening. You will hear uh, more announcements on that. Um, 
we'll put stuff on Facebook. We're, we'll announce it next week at the picnic. Um, that's where everybody will be all together at once anyways. And uh, we're excited about what's happening. We're excited about this new property coming up in August. And uh, we, we got so many things happening. Uh, it's great. We had bridge Friday night. It was, it was the longest bridge in the history of Believer's Chapel. It went from 7 o'clock p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning. It was crazy. Listen, please. They played a game called Risk. Whoever's heard of Risk, right? I, I can't sit. Man, I'm not a patient person. I'm praying about it. Don't judge me. I'm praying on my patience. But Risk takes forever. Like this game never ends. It just keeps going on and on forever. And they played Risk and it ended at 6 a.m. And I laugh at those Risk players. That's great. Awesome. But um, we have so many different things taking place at church. And uh, opening Saturday night, opens up a lot, even extra ministry as well, for GLOW, for Brigade, for Youth Group, uh, for, for weddings. I mean, we, we are strict on weddings. Well, you have to be out by a certain time because we have to clean, rearrange, and get ready for our evening services. Gang, it just, it opens up a lot for Saturday nights. We're very excited about this move that we need to make. Um, <clears throat> come on, if we, if we can open up, please. Oh, that's a lot. I can't wait to preach three times in one day. Sweet. Come on, it's going to be great. We're in a new series called The Greatest Stories Ever Told. Uh, we are going to be going through uh, specific parables. And uh, in, in preparation, gang, when you go through the parables, there are so many different parables with so many different meanings. And I'm, man, I'm studying this thing for weeks and I'm breaking it down. We could do this, these three because it means this and these three because it means this and this. And I'm trying to break it all down. But I tell you, when you have so much, this is the deal. When you have so much to say, one of the hardest things is where to start. So I'm like, God, where do I start with this series? I, I can't wait to get into this. There's so much material. God, we could do this. We could do this. We could do this. We could do this. And, and I'm just like, God, I don't know where to start this thing. And I've been praying and praying and praying. And I came last week to hear Seth. Listen, how about Seth last week? That was a great message. Come on, that was awesome. <laughs> Praise God, my man, Al Bat. He's just a riot. I got one more story for you. I mean, he's just, come on, he's like awesome. And we just, we are so blessed to have people that, that are a part of this ministry uh, just step in and just roll with it, man. It's like what they were created to do, and I believe it, it is. So, uh, and in that message last week, honestly, God gave me the start to where we're headed in, in this new series. And as, as Seth talked about that desire for growth, man, as, and he had this little plant. If you remember the picture, he had this little plant that was coming out of the ground. And right then, I'm just like, God, that's my open right there. The, the sower, the seed, and the soil. What it really takes when the, when, the, when, the, when the seed, the Word of God, takes root in your life, there will be a desire for growth. There will be fruit. There will be fruit in our lives. And man, when, when we understand when the roots go deep and there's, a, there's a, an implantment that takes place in our lives, man, we begin to grow. So from that message last week, I'm very glad that we came and that God really, really put it in my heart. This is where we start uh, this, this new series. And it's going to take us many weeks, probably almost eight weeks to get through the series. But when you understand that Jesus was a master teacher, folks, master teacher. The crowds gather just to listen and just to watch this man go to work. Watch the miracle. See what he did. They even said, no one has ever taught like this man. No one has ever spoke like this with such authority. He was a master teacher. He was the best. And then he got into his storytelling. He was the best storyteller of all that had absolute deep meaning of life change. He gave pictures to what he said. Powerful, powerful pictures. We'll be in this for probably about eight weeks or so, I'm guessing. And we'll just really see some, some life change is going to take place throughout the summer here at Believers. I'm, I'm telling you, please, if you plug into this, there will be life change. And in the summer, you'll be like, man, that was so powerful. These parables are so powerful. And you'll begin to see Jesus as such an incredible master, master teacher. Just amazing. So let's, let's just ask God to bless our time. Luke 8, if, if you want to start turning, turn to Luke 8. We'll go one place and then just kind of roll from there. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for, for your presence in this place. Thank you for worship. Thank you for communion. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is alive and powerful. It is truth. It's life-changing, God. It rearranges our lives and we see it according to your view. We see it according to what you say is right. God, it changes everything. There's power in your word. Father, we ask that by your Spirit, you would just reveal truth to us this morning. God, reveal truth to us this morning. Jesus, as we take this parable, 
And Jesus, we take what you have told, the greatest stories that you have told. Jesus, life-changing stories. Give us a picture this morning of what you were saying in this parable. So important. So important. Father, we ask that by your Spirit you would speak to us today by your Word. God, that we would come truly with an eye to see. Come with an ear to hear. Come with a heart that would respond to your Word. Father, thank you. Folks, I ask that you would ask God this morning, God, speak to me today. God, I'm here. I'm here on purpose. Father, speak to me today. In Jesus' name, amen. And in this parable, it's found in Matthew 13. It's found in Mark 4 and Luke 8. It's found in three of the Gospels. And when you understand when Jesus is, is pitching this picture, Matthew 13 and Mark 4, they, they define it as where Jesus is on this beach. And, and the Bible says that very large crowds were coming. And he's like, all right, I need to kind of step back because there's so many people that are coming. And he steps back. Listen, when you're on the beach and you step back, you're going into water. So he says, listen, bring the boat around. And he steps into the boat and he's off the shore in a boat and he begins to teach to these people. You know what I thought? I mean, I'm reading this and I'm like, it would have been awesome if, if, listen, very large crowd. People couldn't wait to come hear him teach. Wouldn't it be awesome if he just walked out on the water without the boat? I mean, people like... What? I mean, I was like, what is, what is that? That is, they may, they may not hurt anything after that, but there's, this, there's that guy, man, he teaches, he doesn't need a boat. But I, he didn't think that was a great idea, but I thought it would have been funny. But he, he took the boat idea, and uh, he could have, he did that, no worries. Um, but when we understand that he's teaching this to a very large crowd, there's a point in this, in Mark 4, where, where the disciples are like, hey, what did that mean? He says this about this parable. He says, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all parables? He says, listen, this is top shelf, man. If you don't get this, this is how important this is. If you don't see this, you're not going to get any of them. So gang, let's start with this right here in Luke 8. I want, I want you to see this. And, then, and Jesus, man, when he began to teach this, Mark 4 tells us that he started with this, with this behold, man. He says, listen to this. Behold. The word behold, when you see this in Scripture, it really is a declaration like pay attention. This, listen, the master teacher is saying, listen to this, man. Pay attention to what I'm about to say. You've got to hear this. And gang, I tell you this morning, we've got to understand this. And we've got to hear what Jesus is saying this. And in Luke 8, verse 4, it says this. When a large crowd was coming together and those from various cities were journeying to him. Man, folks, you got to get this, man. People gathered to Jesus. He was the, uh, the best teacher of all time. He spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell on the road. Now get this. This is the sower, the seed, and the soil. The sower is unknown. The Bible says that God's the sower of seed. Christ is the sower of seed. The Holy Spirit is the sower of seed. And you know who else is the sower of seed? You and I. Because when you understand what he's talking about, the seed here, the seed is the Word of God. This right here. This is what we are to sow is the Word of God. And God, listen, Christ is saying this is so, you've got to understand the value of the Word. He says, if you don't get this, you don't get anything. You've got to understand how important the seed is. The seed is the Word of God. And if we, if we discredit the Word of God, if we discredit the seed, you're never going to have any growth. This is where he is saying this is so important that you understand the value of the Word of God. This is how critical this is that we never discredit, we never add to it, we don't take from it, we don't make things up, we don't say, well, that's what God said then, but it doesn't apply now. Gang, none of that. Jesus is saying this is how critical this is, is this is the seed. And the Bible says this, the sower went out to sow his seed. That's the Word of God. And as he sowed, some fell by the road. And it was trampled up under feet. The birds of the air ate it up. Now, get a, you ever see a bird eat a seed? It's the seed's there and the seed's gone. I mean, just that, that you see a bird peck, you got to get this picture. Because when he goes in and defines this, you're going to see what he's talking about. It's like a bird, there's a, there's a seed it was and it was not. I mean, that's, birds, they, they, they just chomp it right up. So it says this, verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns. Or I'm sorry, verse 6, other seed fell on the rocky soil and it was... And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked out. Other seed fell on good soil and grew up, 
and produce a crop a hundred times as great. And as he said these things, he would call. Look at as he said these things, he would call out. I could see him calling out. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Very large crowd. Jesus in the boat. Those are on the sand. And as he's preaching this, he stops. He said, those who have an ear, let him hear. He's saying, listen, pay attention to this. Master teacher, folks. Master teacher. So you have the sower who's unknown. It's, there's many different us. We are, we are called to be saved. We're called to bear fruit. We're called to sow seed. We're called to serve. All of us, when we open this and we preach, or all of us, whether it's over coffee, all of us, when we lead our families in devotions, you're planting seed, folks. All of us should be sowers of seed. He says, but then there's four grounds. There's four soils. And soil is the heart. You've got the sower, You've got the seed, which is the word, and then you've got the soil, which is the heart of man. That's who you really are, folks. That's the inner person. That's who you really are, is your heart. So he says there's four conditions to a man's heart, not to mankind's heart. Four conditions. And every one of us fall under that boat. Anyone who's ever had breath falls under one of these four conditions, folks. And I want you to see this. Look at this. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. The seed is, what is the Word of God? It is active, it is powerful, it is alive, it is truth. And when you understand this, again, why is this so important? He said, listen, you are sowing truth. Listen, we live in, in a land of all kinds of different truths, but there's one truth, the Word of God, all kinds of different lies, all kinds of different things that will, that will try to contradict the truth. Listen, the enemy hates the Word of God. He hates the seed that we plant here. Do you understand that I am trying to do everything I can to plant to as many people as possible? I am throwing seed as far as I can. To, I'm throwing seed to as many people as I possibly can throw seed to. My responsibility, your responsibility, is to sow the seed. We are not responsibility for the condition of the man's heart, of mankind's heart. There's nothing you can do about that. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. And you and I come to a place and say, God, I'm going to throw as much seed. I'm going to put as much gospel out there as I possibly can put out there and see where it lands. God, we're begging you for, to bring in those who will have a heart and will have an ear to, to hear exactly what you say. That, God, you would bring in those that you understand, God, that their soil can be ripe. And when they hear the gospel, when they hear the word, God, they respond to it as your word says. That's how powerful this is. Look at this. Come on. When you understand that the parable is this. This is why he says, if you don't get this, you don't understand anything. This is the word. The, what, we're, what we're sowing here, the seed is the word of God. It is truth. It is something that cannot perish. Come on. Uh, First Peter, please. For you have been born again, not of a seed. There it is. The seed, which is perishable but imperishable, cannot ever be perished, folks. That is through the living, enduring Word of God. What is the seed? The living, enduring Word of God. His Word endures forever. Unchanging Word of God. Not like God changes His mind. So I didn't mean that. I don't mean it now. I meant it then, but I... Folks, when you understand how real this is, you understand His truth lasts for an eternity. For an eternity. We've got to understand that. Isaiah 55 says this about the seed. For as rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing, get this now, furnishing seed to the sower, bread to the either, so my word so will my word be. What's that? Seed, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter of which I sent it. Listen, God equates His word, the word that He spoke, we believe that this is God breathed to man, to us, and it is just like the snow and the water that bears and brings forth fruit and waters the seed. And He says this, so will my word be. What? The seed. Gang, when you want to, how much planning are you doing in your own life with the Word of God? We expect a crop, but are you laying, uh, seriously, come on. We expect a crop as believers. We expect to be fruitful as believers. But the question is this, how much seed are you putting in your ground, in your heart? 
How much seed, how much time do you spend in his word? How much time are you spending planting his word in your heart, expecting it to bear fruit? Here we want to walk these unshakable lives. We want to walk this life that is steadfast and immovable. We want to walk this life that is, that is bearing fruit, that is salt and light. And we are walking in a way, but it's not happening. Why is that? How much fruit are you bearing because of how much seed you're sowing? And when we understand, man, that is, that's why he says this is so empowering. When you understand what it is to sow this into your heart, God says the promises, then you will bear fruit. But people want to be fruit bearers. And my question is, well, how much seed are you planting? Well, I don't really, I don't really read the Bible. And then you're not planting any seed, but yet you are expecting a crop. How foolish is that? I mean, honestly, the real deal is how foolish is that? I'm going to be a farmer, but honey, we're going to watch our gardens grow, but we're never going to throw any seed on the ground. Your wife would look at you, you get out. What's wrong with you? I mean, come on. We, but it's the same thing here. This is what Jesus is saying. We expect to bear a crop. We expect to be fruitful, but we never plant any seed in our own lives. Gang, how much time? Seriously, how much time are you spending in the Word of God? How much time are you spending planting seed? in your soil. Now look at this. We've got to see this. Come on. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Verse 12. Those beside the road. Those are who... Listen, there's four types of soil. We're going to talk about those. The, the one that's by the road. Those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. Who the devil comes. Matthew calls him the evil one. And Matthew says he snatches it away. Remember the bird takes the seed and it's there and then it's gone? Well, in Matthew, he becomes very aggressive and says, the evil one comes and snatches. That's an aggressive move to snatch away, to grab and pull, snatch. Okay, that's, that's what the evil one does. Listen, he, he hates the word of God. He hates this seed because he knows that this can lead to life and salvation. James 1 says this, this is what leads to salvation. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, and all that remains of wickedness. In, in humility, receive the word implanted. The word implanted means to be engrafted. It means to grow roots and to be firm. Receive the word. Here's the seed implanted, which is able to save your souls. Listen, the enemy, the evil one, Satan, the devil. Listen, M Mark calls him Satan. So here you've got, now he calls him the devil who comes in and snatches away or takes away that seed so that it never bears fruit. Now look at this. Why is that? So that they will not, be, they will not believe and be saved. And when we understand that we do face a very real enemy who hates, hates the Word of God. Because he understands when this is implanted on good soil, what's the fruit? Saved souls. Hates that. Does everything he can to try to twist Scripture. Does everything he can to try to get people to question Scripture. Does everything he can to get people not to read the Scripture. Does everything he can, even in churches, to just be so lukewarm and watered down they don't actually even preach the Word. Gang, aren't you glad that you believe and belong to a place that believes that this is the absolute Word of God and this is what changes lives when it is implanted into good soil? Satan hates that. He comes and he tries to snatch it away. Now look at this. Verse 13, those on the rock of soil are those when they, when they hear, they receive the Word with joy and these have no firm root. For they believe for a while, and in time of temptation they fall away. Matthew and Mark describe this one, this soil, the rocky soil, as the one that they receive it with joy. They get all emotional. But when affliction and persecution come because of the Word, not just because of life, but because of the Word, he calls them a deserter. Well, then they leave. Then they give up. Then they withdraw. The word fall away, it means the deserter. It means the one who fell away, the one who withdrew, the one who left. Why? Because affliction. Oh, you mean we're supposed to give up things? You mean this actually may cost me something? You mean I'm, I'm supposed to stand my ground to the Word of God? You mean I, I can't just go with the flow? I can't just be a man pleaser anymore? You mean I can't just live my own way? Because the Word has been implanted in me that changes things? Yes, changes everything. Well, I want no part of it then. And we see this, we see this picture. Well, the first picture is the closed heart. 
where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And in John 8, he says this, for a picture of the first soil, he says this, you wish to kill me because my word never took root in you. Never had a part in my word. Closed heart. Second heart is this emotional heart. The rocky soil is the emotional heart. You, you ever seen this heart at work? Where people come in, oh, I got saved, it was great, I heard the word, I love church, this is awesome. And they come, and then the next thing I know, they're calling me saying, man, Jehovah Witness showed up to my house, and now I'm a Jehovah Witness, man. They, and I'm just like, what? And then they call back and say, man, I got involved in Buddhist, and now I'm a, and you're just like, oh, you're that emotional heart. You're great for a season. And you jump on the next thing that sounds great. But there's really no depth. When, when, when you understand it costs you something to stand your ground on word. Yes, God said that. Yes, God meant that. And when you come to a place that you have to agree with God when it comes to homosexuality, when you come to a place where you have to agree with God that, that marriage is between a man and a woman, when you come to a place to realize that God does say to give, when you come, and, and you want to come and say, well... No, I, I'm not going to stand my ground there. When you come to a place to say that life in the womb is a gift from God and we as men are not supposed to take that life. See, when you understand that what Jesus is talking about here, this is a serious test. You can identify a fake really quick. This, this calls out the fake, folks. This identifies a fake real quick. Did God mean what he said? Yes. And we as a church stand our ground exactly what God said. And he meant what he said, folks. But it's like identify a, a, a fake real quick, folks. We say, well, because of the word, you mean I'm gonna, people are going to make fun of me? Because of the word, people are going to persecute me? Because of the word, because I stand my ground on what God said, people aren't going to like me? At times, yes. Well, I want no part of that. That's what the rocky soil is, folks. And it's very similar to the hard road. Now look at this. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns. And, I, and I, I look at this, and I see America here in this. The seed which fell among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, what the seed is choked with the worries and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and brings no fruit to maturity. Gang, this here, this is the preoccupied heart. This is the heart that says, yeah, uh, man, I accept the word. This is great. But then you understand priorities. You, you never understood that Jesus becomes the priority. You never understood what it is to really say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are everything. You are my master. You are my teacher. I submit myself to you. You are my authority. You are sir. You are divine. You are Lord. You never really got that. You become preoccupied and say, well, there is Jesus and that's great. But there's also all these other things that I'm not willing to give up. Because Jesus really isn't the center. Jesus really isn't my all. Jesus really isn't my priority. And Mark 10 gives us a great picture of this one. This, here is one who is the rich young ruler. He comes, gang, you got to see this, because this is a perfect picture of the one who is preoccupied. This is a perfect picture of the one who comes. Listen, the Bible says, this is a true story. This isn't a parable. The, the Mark 10, the rich young ruler runs. The Bible says he ran to Jesus and fell at his feet. Could you imagine Jesus here, rich, young ruler here? The Bible says he was extremely rich, man. He was loaded, had lots of property. He is kneeling at the feet of Jesus, who is divine, who is God in the flesh, who have come to save mankind, to redeem. He's there right at the feet of Jesus, and he asks this amazing question. What's it take for eternal life? How did he know to go to him to ask that divine question? He's at the feet of the only one who can answer that. The only one who can save. How do I get eternal life? And Jesus said, listen, the commandments. He says, I've held every one of the commandments. This guy did right. He's very religious. He understood the word. Yes, yes, I've done all the commandments. That I've followed all that. Cool, I'm in. Mark 10 says, because Jesus had a love for him. Don't miss that. Because Jesus had a love for him, he said, go sell all your possessions, give to the poor. You know what the man did? The man got up and walked away. He said, I'm not willing to do that. Folks, it wasn't about money. It's about priority. He says, my money 
is more important than Jesus. It's not about having a lot of money. That's not his issue here. His issue is his money was more important to him than Jesus and eternal life. Gang, he's right there. He's so close to Jesus. He can touch his feet. He's right there. I'm the only one that can say, ask him the one divine question. How do I get to heaven? How do I have eternal life? And Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus, I'm the way. Jesus, I'm the truth. Jesus said, I'm the life. Nobody comes to the Father. It's me. And he said, no, nah, I'd rather have my riches. Gang, that's the preoccupied mind. That's the American mind, folks. We'd rather be so consumed with everything else except Jesus. Jesus can be a side note. Jesus can be a sidebar. Jesus can be there, but, but he can't be most important in my life. And then we come to the good soil. This, this promise is in the good soil, folks. I want you to see this. Look at this. Verse 15, in the seed, in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, gang, this is the accepting heart. You've got the closed heart, you've got the emotional heart, you've got the preoccupied heart, then you've got the accepting heart. You've got this heart right here. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance, man. Bear fruit. They stand firm. They persevere. They endure. They overcome. They stand the test of time, folks. Persecution and affliction come to the Word, they say, okay, I stand on the Word of God. When, when priorities come to a place, say, Jesus is my priority. Jesus is first in my life. Nothing in my world compares to Jesus. They understand it. They get it. They're an accepting heart. They're an understanding heart. They're one who has an honest and good heart, and they accept it. It goes deep, and it plants itself. It is implanted in them and bears roots to make them firm. I want you to turn to Luke 6, please, because I want you to see this as a picture. Two pages to your left. Luke 6 says this. Verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? This is Jesus. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? What a serious question, folks. And he's referencing some of the soil here. The emotional soil. The preoccupied soil. Maybe there was a day you actually called me Lord. Why don't you do what I say? Why is it just lip service? That doesn't mean anything to you that you call me Lord. Because if you understood what it was, this is what he's saying. If you understood what it was to call me Lord, when that seed, when my word fell on your heart, there would be a result. You call me Lord, Lord, but it's nothing to you. It means nothing. There's no, there's no service there. It's just lip service. Because you don't even do what I say. That's powerful, folks. That's powerful when you see this. Jesus is saying, you call me Lord, Lord. You say that I'm master. You say that I'm the ultimate teacher. You say that I'm supreme. You say that I'm divine. You say that you submit myself, yourself to me. You say that you walk under my authority, but you don't even do what I say. And then he says this. Here's the promise to the good soil. Here's the promise to the heart. When the seed is planted, folks, it bears fruit. When the seed is planted, folks, you become firmly planted. Look at this. For everyone who comes to me and hears my word, here's the seed, and acts on them. Here's the obedience. This is the promise of obedience, folks. Please hear this. Don't miss it. This is the great news here. And, 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 and acts on them. There's a promise, folks, to our obedience. He says this, I will show you. Listen, I'll show you that heart, that good soil heart. I will show you that working. I will show you that when that seed is planted in that good ground, when that seed is planted in that honest and good heart, that heart that understands, that heart that accepts, when that heart, when it bears root and it goes deep and there is a firmness in this, he says, let me show you what takes place. Let me show you the result of that. And this is what he says. This is amazing. He, that heart, is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. Gang, his word becomes a 
a foundation. That seed implanted in our hearts in the good soil, that is a foundation that we build upon. And when the flood occurred and the torrent burst against the house, it could not be shaken because it was well built. Gang, there is a promise to the good heart soil. There is a promise to that soil that accepts the Word of God. There is a promise to the soil who puts priority of, of, of Christ first. There is a promise to that heart, to that soil that says, listen, I will not be preoccupied. You will be my everything. There is a promise to those who go through the affliction and the persecution, standing their ground because of the seed that has been implanted in their heart. And Christ Himself says, the promise of obedience is that you will not be shaken. The promise of obedience is when the storms come, when the different issues of life slam against your house, that you will stand your ground because you were built on the foundation and you will not be shaken. Folks, where are you in this this morning? Where are you in this this morning? Come on, let's bow our heads, please. Folks, you come to a place to be more concerned about popular view and political view, public view. Do you put that as more important than God's view? Your soil's messed up. Do you look at the different things in our culture today that the culture has accepted, but God has not? And you say it's okay? Your soil's messed up. You come to a place today, and I think this hits so many people, that you are so preoccupied. Listen, please hear this. Please hear this. The enemy loves the rat race, folks. He loves us to be so stinking busy. So stressed and worried about the next thing. So preoccupied. All of a sudden, Jesus becomes second, third, fourth, fifth, and eventually really not existent in our lives. I'm just too busy for church. Why? Well, I got to work, and I got to work, and I got to work, and... My heart breaks for that because I think there's so many that fall in that soil. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who've heard and then they go on their way and they're choked with the worries, the riches, and the pleasures of this life. The enemy loves that, folks. Because people may actually think that they're safe in that soil. But Come on, please hear this. When we come to a place, to say the pleasures of this world, the temporary, the here and now, the things that I can see, touch, and feel now, the rat race I live, is more important than Jesus. I could go in so many places right now, folks. I could go in so many places with that seed. Can I just say this? What about your home? Is your home a complete rat race? Everybody working, everybody going every direction? When it comes down for Jesus, we're too tired? There's really not a focus in our homes about Christ and His Word? Because we're just too busy? Because everybody works and everybody runs crazy and when it's really time to plant seed in our home, we have no time. The enemy loves that, folks. Come on, he loves that. Come on, God. Listen, Jesus said this is most important. You've got to understand the importance of the Word. How much planting are we doing in our homes? Are we even home to plant, folks? <clears throat> or are we honestly just too busy? But yet think we're okay. 
Now Jesus and the Word of God just got choked. And maybe you're in this place going, man, that is me. Jesus has been second, third, and fourth, and I'm at a place where Jesus is so distant. You call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. Jesus said, this is so important. If you don't get this, you don't get it. Father, please help us this morning in this. Jesus, by Your Spirit, You would check us in this this morning. In this, in this right here. What is the condition of our hearts? Father, what's the condition of our hearts this morning? Please reveal to us this morning. Folks, what has God spoke to you this morning? What is the condition of your heart? You run that rat race that you are so preoccupied. You come to the place when affliction and persecution come because you've accepted the Word, that you no longer want to be a part of the Word. You think it's just easier. Or are you in a place this morning you say, Sean, that's my heart, man. I'm a good soil. Honest and good heart. I accept the Word of God and I see it for what He said. And I walk in obedience to it. And in that, the winds will come. And the waves will slam against my house. But you said I won't be shaken, Jesus. That's what you said. That's the promise to obedience. That I won't be shaken. And that I stand my ground. And that I will endure and persevere. That's who I am. That's the Word in me. Because my heart is of good soil. Folks, is that you this morning? Father, please. God, please help us identify our heart today. That we would do what's necessary this morning, here and now, to have good soil. To see Your Word and accept it. Walk on obedience to it. And enjoy the promise of not being shaken. What a promise. What a promise. And all heads bowed, I just want to ask you a question. Is that your soil today? Man, I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you right here and now. If you know that's not your soil, if you know that's not the condition of your heart, Gang, I can't do anything about the condition of your heart. All I can do is sow the seed. That's all I got. That's all I got. It's up to you. You can say, God, I want that good soil. God, I want to hear your word. I want to obey it. God, I want to see it for what you said. God, I want to accept it. I want to walk in obedience to it. That's who I want to be that I would walk in obedience to Your Word. And that, God, I will not be shaken. Jesus, I will not be shaken. You are Lord. You are my Lord and You are my authority. And I put myself under You and I will walk in obedience to what You say because You are my Lord. And I will not be shaken. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Amen.